Hey guys and welcome back to a new video. A new month is over and it's time again for Philips Android News, this time for April. And I actually have a lot of cool new news for you, which I will show you in this video. So news that affect us Android developers in our everyday work life. So regarding Kotlin, regarding Android, regarding new APIs, regarding new library updates, all that stuff. So if you want to know that and if you want to stay up to date in the Android world, then definitely watch this video till the end. And I want to start with a new requirement that will be there for new apps that you, uh, that you upload to Google Play. And that new requirement will apply starting from November this year, so November 2022. So when you as an end user get one of the latest Android devices, spend a lot of money, then you kind of expect that the apps you install on that device also use kind of the, the latest and most up-to-date security and privacy features. And right now, anybody can pretty much upload any type of app to Google Play, no matter from when that app actually is and when it was made. And that is what Google now wants to change starting in November this year. So on Android, we have that concept of this target SDK where we can specify an Android version. We basically tell Google, so this is the version we tested our app on. That's the version it runs on uh, pretty smoothly and stuff like that. And then we upload that so Google knows, okay, that's the version uh, the developers actually tested the app on. However, now they will have that requirement that the target SDK must at least be the Android version that was released two years ago. So what that means is, let's say you publish an app in November. In November this year, there will be Android 13, which will be the most up-to-date version. And with this new requirement, if you want to upload an app to Google Play, that means your app at least needs to target Android 11. So the Android version from two years ago. And that way users can just be sure that the apps they use, use yeah, pretty much the, the most up-to-date security features and privacy features. So yeah, they, they can feel pretty safe. And as usual here in this format, what do I think of this new change? Well, um, of course that requires some more maintenance work for larger apps because you're kind of forced to consistently update your target SDK. But I think in this case it's actually a good thing um, because, yeah, if I am a user and I think from a user's perspective and I spend a lot of money for an expensive device, then I kind of expect that um, the apps I install on this device don't feel like they, they come from the Middle Ages. Of course, Google uses this also as kind of a mechanism to force developers to use the most up-to-date mechanisms and the most up-to-date APIs. They include just like scope storage, for example. So over the time, you just have to consistently update your app. That is what this change will actually do here in future. Let's get to another exciting news here. And that is that the first beta of Android 13 is out. So in the past two Android news, I actually talked about the previous already. So preview one and preview two, I think it was. Um, so basically what was new there, a little summary, we now have notification permissions, which I had a little rant about in the, in the last video. Um, we have things like uh, themed app icons, we have a new photo picker dialog, and a lot more minor changes that I talked about. And now with this first beta they released, we actually have some more changes. If you've watched the previous video, then you know that I find this new notification permission a little bit overkill. And now I have amazing news for you, and that is we get even more permissions, yay! So currently in Android, if we want to access storage, if you want to read some media files, then we have that permission read external storage. And that gives us access to these media files. Starting with Android 13, Google actually wants to split up this big read external storage permission into three smaller permissions. On the one hand, we will have the permission read media images, we have read media videos and we have read media audio. So these three new permissions are used to just access images, to just access videos or to just access audio files from external storage. So that means if your app actually needs to access all of these file types, you need to request three permissions now instead of just one. However, if your app actually requests um, the images and the video permission together, then this will at least appear as one dialog. So you, you don't have to do all that fetching for like all that validating of that permission stuff for two permissions in that case. I think that's the way I understood it. But still, yeah, you have to request more permissions if you want to access all types of media files. And this behavior will apply to all apps that target Android 13, which you will 
migrate to at some point because thanks to the first news Google now forces you to do that at least in two and a half years because in uh, yeah November or somewhere in uh, fall they will release Android 13 and from then on you have two years to target Android 13 at least or you don't really have two years but in two and a half years it will be too late that is what i'm trying to say so you with, within this two and a half years now you will have time to <laughs> to migrate and adapt to that so what do i think of that to split up this read external storage permission it sounds super painful and i think it is super painful if your app actually needs to access all these different media files um, but i think it won't be that bad because when when i think about which apps really do need access to all these different types of media files then I can't think of very many. So usually when you have an app, you just need to access photos or photos and videos, which together come with one permission dialog, um, or just audio files if you have an audio player or so, but it's pretty rare, I think, that you need all of these three. Um, and if you have like a file explorer, file manager, then you have that manage external storage permission anyways, which gives you access to the whole file system without this extra permission stuff here. So I think it won't be that bad from a user's per perspective. It is a good change, I think, because you know, okay, this app only has access to my photos and not like you have a gallery app and it gets access to all your audio files and videos as well. Like maybe videos, but not audio files. That wouldn't make much sense. And another cool change that came with Android 13 is that they extended the Audio Manager API. So if you're now building some kind of music, song, app or so, then this will probably be quite helpful for you because they now extended that with a function get audio devices for attributes, which can be used to find out audio devices your song can actually be played at. And this will be a pretty cool feature for media apps that like to display some kind of list with audio devices you can actually play a song at. And that's it for the Android part of this video, but we're not done yet because there is an exciting change in, reg in regards to Kotlin, and that is that a new Kotlin version is released, and that is the version 1.6.20. Or actually, there's also already 1.6.21, which just contained a little, little bug fix and stuff like that. So what is new with Kotlin 1.6.20? On the one hand, there are a bunch of optimizations, compile optimizations, like memory optimizations, that stuff, which I don't think I need to go into detail here, but we have two cool new language features, which are kind of experimental now, but I actually want to dive into IntelliJ here to show you these two features and show you how these work. So starting with the first feature, and that is called context receivers. That was included in Kotlin for a while in the preview version, but now they actually put it into the stable version, but still marked as experimental and you still need to opt into that. Um, I'm in IntelliJ here and you need to add these compiler arguments here to enable that feature in combination with the latest Kotlin version here, of course. So what is a context receiver? You can see the IDE still has issues to highlight the syntax and stuff like that. Maybe I'm doing something wrong here, but I think that's just because it's so experimental and it's not fully included in Kotlin yet. But I still want to talk about how that now works. So it's kind of a reverse extension function, you can say. Not really, but with this new context keyword, that will actually be a keyword. We can now declare a specific context in which our function needs to be called. So all we really do here is we have a class hello world logger that has a function to log something, to log hello world. Nothing really special, super simple example. And this function do something, if this should let's say log something, we of course need an instance of this hello world logger. So what we could do is instead of this, we could also pass this logger here. Um, let's say we have a logger of type hello world logger. And then we could say, okay, logger.log. And then that would work pretty well. However, with these context receivers, we can also do something like this. And it will look like there's an error, but there is actually no error here. Um, because we say, okay, if we actually have a hello world logger in scope, then we can call do something and else we can't. What does it mean to have a hello world logger in scope? Well, if we have something like with, for example, then you can see we get this little IDE hint, this of type hello world logger. And this means in this scope, we can directly call functions on this instance of hello world logger. So we could call log directly 
which calls this log function here from the hello world logger instance since we used one here using the with keyword. And you can also see we can call do something here because we are in the scope where we have access to a hello world logger. And if we launch this, then you will see it simply prints hello world. If we, however, move this function out of this with keyword and launch this, you can see no, no required context receiver found because, of course, now it doesn't know which hello world logger it should use because we don't pass one as a parameter and we also don't call this in a scope where we have access to a hello world logger. logger. And there is actually a very cool video from the Kotlin channel the Kotlin developers about this, which is like 30 minutes long, and which goes into this in a lot more detail. So if you're interested in that, in which use cases that can be very helpful, then I will link this video down below here in this video's description. However, we still have another feature, another new Kotlin language feature to talk about, and that is um, callable references to interface constructors, I think it's called. Maybe I'm wrong here, but I think that was the name, and it was quite complex. So what does it mean? Let's say we have an interface thread, um, which I just manually imp implemented here, and that has a function run. And then we have a function that just returns such a thread and simply converts that interface here into a Lambda function. So for example, here we could then simply say, okay, we have a thread here from our other file. Um, I think that's it, yeah. And then we can directly call this run function here of that thread using the Lambda, um, yeah, the Lambda way of writing this in Kotlin. And if we want to do that, we need to specify it like that. So we create an anonymous class of this thread, so an anonymous class that implements this interface. We override the run function, and then we call our Lambda. Now with the new language feature, these callable references to interface constructors, we can have an abbreviated way of doing this. And that is just that we get rid of all this, and we say function interface. Yes, function interfaces are now a thing in Kotlin, and you can see we can still do the uh, we can still do the same thing here, and we get rid of all this boilerplate code. So I think this is something that won't be used too often because yeah, it's pretty rare that I have such a function here um, that just converts like an interface into a lambda. But if you have that and you use this function interface, then this is kind of a syntactical sugar overload, I think. Um, so it's a very beautiful way of um, removing this model plate code. And yeah, they, from the Kotlin team, they still say that is um, experimental and you need to opt into that. And they might remove it in future, they might change it in future. So I would be a little bit careful with using that in production, um, same as the context receivers right now, of course. That's just for experimentation, and once they will actually make it stable, I will of course announce this here in these uh, future Android news, of course. Which of these news are you actually looking forward to the most? Let me know that below, and if you actually missed the previous Android news, which are still relevant right now, of course, then you can simply click here and not miss that episode.